Hi, I'm Dr. Dale Matchek, Chairman of the Econ Program at Northfield University. And this is the 2020 Freedom Seminar, a conference in which we apply the principles of the Northwood idea to issues of the day. And in this particular session, we are going to be discussing ethical leadership in a time of crisis. Um, as one of our speakers mentioned yesterday, uh, there this isn't unprecedented. There have been many crises that people have faced in the past and it's tested their leadership skills and we can learn from what they've done well and from their mistakes. And we've brought uh, somebody here today who's uh, well positioned to do that. His name is Dr. David Bezzetta. He's an executive business advisor and adjunct professor of management at Northwood University. And for more than 11 years, he managed process improvement incentives at Fortune 50 companies in the United States, Mexico, and Europe. For the last six years, David has managed a number of program reviews with Ford. And since 2005, he has worked as business advisor at BASF, uh, BASF, the world's largest chemical company, where he's managed numerous process improvement projects, including supply chain collaborative process optimization methodology, which sounds like a very complex operation. Uh, he's got his doctor in management in executive leadership from Walsh College, where his research was focused on ethical and moral leadership. And his recently published dissertation, Whistleblowers and Post-Conventional Moral Development, Identifying Ethical and Moral Leaders, Measured Moral Reasoning Skills of Whistleblowers. And he continues to speak, lecture, and facilitate groups at organizations, universities, and symposiums around the world. And we are very fortunate uh, to have him with us here today to discuss ethical leadership in a time of crisis. Uh, welcome, David. Thank you, Dale. Um, good morning. I'm very uh, happy and actually privileged to uh, participate again um, for the second year in a row uh, uh, with you in the Freedom Seminar. And I, I thank you for the invitation and opportunity to do so again this year, uh, although in slightly different format, um, but but I, uh, I feel very honored to participate in this in this great program that you put together. Okay, um, Dale said uh, we're going to talk this morning about uh, <clears throat> about a topic that um, I was saying before we got started uh, has actually caused me to um, to focus more directly on uh, on the decisions that are made in a crisis. And I've I've titled the presentation "Follow the Leader: Decisions Made in a Crisis" uh, because at the end of the day, that's that's exactly what we do. Um, as a society, as a nation, we uh, we follow the decisions that are made by uh, the leaders that that we elect into those positions to make those decisions. So um, just as kind of a quick overview in terms of what we will be talking about, uh, I'll give you an overview in general of, of the discussion this morning. I think it's important to understand a little bit about my background and the reason why I am qualified to, to talk about the topic. Uh, it's also important to uh, provide some foundational building blocks. So we'll talk briefly about the ethical decision-making process. There is a process that exists. There's also a, a way to measure and quantify the decisions that are part of that process. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that just so that you all have a an understanding and a foundation before we actually go in and explore uh, three events, three crises that have taken place uh, in recent times uh, with Pearl Harbor, 9-11, and the current coronavirus um, crisis that, that we're in. Uh, I'll summarize that and then we'll open it up to, uh, to any questions that you might have. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important also to uh, to understand uh, that we are um, in a in a very fast paced world today. Um, we, as I said, elect individuals, officials to make decisions on our behalf. 
we understand, try to learn as much as we can about those individuals. But in the pre-election process that we have as part of the Republic, um, it is important that uh, we understand who we are electing to, to be making these decisions. And we also understand that once these under individuals represent us, that they are making decisions that are aligned with and uh, assure the best interest of the citizens of the United States based on the fundamental principles of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Uh, in putting this discussion together this morning, um, I, I ask myself, is that always true? Has that always been true? And so to help answer that question, we'll, we'll look at a couple of different scenarios. Um, we'll look at not only the crises, but we'll also look at the, uh, the decisions made and the impact of those decisions, especially the impact on individual civil, civil liberties. So um, we'll start, um, as I said, by exploring those three scenarios. But before we do that, I'd like just to give a little bit about my background um, and so that you have an understanding of who I am and, and kind of where I'm coming from. I spent 21 years as a uh, finance executive at Chrysler slash Daimler Chrysler, a uh, number of different uh, positions during that time. Uh, primarily, though, what has helped focus and uh, preceded the research, uh, preceded a, a, an event that I'll talk about in a minute. I headed up the North American Operations Audit Group for two years while I was at Chrysler. And fascinating experience, uh, traveled around the world, uh, got a bird's eye view of, of all of the processes and activities associated with the manufacturing of uh, trucks and, and auto automobiles. Um, since then, I've uh, worked the last 15 years at BASF, still doing the same type of process, uh, looking for process improvement opportunities, primarily in the supply chain with a number of different business units uh, within BASF. Um, I also have a, uh, a doctorate degree, as Dale mentioned, from Walsh College. It's a doctor of management uh, with uh, focus on executive leadership. I did some um, pretty extensive research on whistleblowers. Uh, I actually interviewed and surveyed 250 whistleblowers, got to meet and uh, interview uh, a half a dozen of those individuals face to face, uh, which which was a fascinating experience, and it all led to the um, uh, creation of my doctoral dissertation, which was published, and it had to do with the cognitive moral development or the moral reasoning skills of those whistleblowers. I've um, been married to forty years, uh, for forty years to. Uh, uh, to my uh, to my wife Cheryl, we have two daughters and uh, two grandchildren. Uh, our daughter is uh, in Texas with our grandchildren. Our other daughter is here in Michigan, expecting her first child in September. And uh, we also, um, as a family, uh, own a small business, a Pilates studio um, that has uh, been victim to uh, some of the state restrictions, the stay at home and the business closures that have taken place. So I can speak firsthand to some of the decisions uh, that have been made in the uh, COVID-19 environment that we've been in uh, for a number of months now. Um, lastly, uh, let me focus on, on one aspect of my background that for a long time was very difficult to talk about. Um, it actually was the reason um, that I uh, left Chrysler, and it had to do with the whistleblowing uh, event in 2004. And as part of my responsibility at the, as the head of North American Audit, I also um, had the responsibility of um, looking for gaps in the process and uh, looking for abnormalities. Um, as part of that 
I um, uncovered a number of um, unethical and illegal activities that led to the um, imposition of a, at the time, sixth largest penalty and fine against Daimler Chrysler uh, for foreign corrupt violations of foreign corrupt policy uh, practices act. And um, without going into a lot of details, it was uh, a life changing event. It certainly challenged my personal integrity, uh, my personal resolve. And at the time uh, was an unbelievable event that um, uh, quite frankly, I chose to do the right thing regardless of the personal consequences. I knew the consequences involved with the decision that I was going to make. As we'll talk about in a minute, um, decisions um, often, if not always, include consequences, many times personal consequences. Uh, so I think that this event, which now 16 years later I can look back and say, um, was actually um, probably the best thing that ever happened to me in terms of what it has allowed me to do since then, what it has allowed me to do in terms of my pursuit of knowledge, uh, my ability to give back in terms of an academic setting, teaching a course on ethical leadership and moral development. Uh, I, I'm truly blessed uh, from everything that's happened in my life. And that's kind of the mosaic that um, that makes up who I am and where I've come from. So with that in mind, uh, with an understanding of, of my background and the decisions that, uh, that I made um, as part of not only the, the very public event, but as kind of the moral compass, the moral direction that I think many people have Let's just take a minute or two and look at the decision-making process, the, the ethical decision-making process. Life is, um, life is a series of decisions. Um, I think it's safe to say that as individuals, we're faced with dilemmas in every walk of, of life, personal, professional, um, and those decisions and those dilemmas require a decision. A decision in many cases can be not making a decision at all, um, turning your back on a decision. At the end of the day, uh, there's a fork in the road that we all come to as part of the decision making process that is uh, what's right and what's wrong. A different definition exists uh, for each and every individual. We rely on the voice in our head. We rely on our gut, if you will. But there is a process that takes place. And the process itself is based on uh, and has been studied and, and researched is based on theories of, of ethics, theories of the uh, ethical theories based on uh, the teachings of uh, Plato and Socrates and Jeremy Betham, uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, Immanuel Kant. Um, as part of the course that I teach, it's, it's important to have an appreciation for those key theories because they actually lend themselves to the decision-making process. They lend themselves in the fact that we're able to take those theories and apply them to a uh, process in which we're able to measure and quantify decisions, uh, categorize them actually, uh, in alignment with those uh, ethical theories of utilitarianism, relativism, uh, consequential ethics, uh, and duty-based ethics as well. So it's important then with that framework or that understanding of ethical theory to, to look at the decision-making process. Um, what are the steps that are, uh, that take place unconsciously? Uh, we don't, every time we make a decision, analyze and go through with paper and pencil and 
Um, sometimes we do list pros and cons and things like that. But when faced with a fight or flight uh, type reaction uh, dilemma, if you will, this is all inherent, this process. And, and things come into play very quickly. Uh, there, there is an, a, an instantaneous assessment on the moral intensity of the issue, the degree of uh, the choice that's about to be made. What, what impact morally um, does it have on an individual? There's a big difference between making a decision on what to do when you find a $10 bill on the sidewalk versus being faced with the idea that an organization is working with secret bank accounts, for example. Um, both ends of the spectrum but and very different types of moral intensity associated with the eventual decision that will be made. A very big impact is the internal and external influences that go into this instantaneous decision. What I mean by that is that um, as we as we uh, mature and as we go through the different stages of our life, uh, we're impacted by uh, religious influences, uh, cultural influences, family, friends. By the time we get into our professional environments, there's uh, organizational uh, characteristics, organizational cultures that influence a decision, and and most importantly. Uh, peer pressure. So it's important to understand that these influences also instantaneously come into play in terms of the overall decision that needs to be made. Uh, lastly, the understanding and question that instinctively gets asked by that voice in your head, what's going to happen to me? What happens if I make uh, choice A or choice B. And that decision um, in terms of what's going to happen to me is a guiding principle. And as a matter of fact, research has been done where 80% um, or more of the adult population bases decisions on uh, personal consequences. Uh, before I make this decision, uh, what exactly is going to happen to me? I'm going to lose my job. Okay, fine. That helps me make that decision. So it's important to understand the context um, about what we're talking about this morning and about the decisions that leaders make in times of crisis, that it's not um, typically flipping a coin. Uh, it's, it's inherent. It's part of the individual's structure. It's part of their makeup. And we, we like to think that with these elected officials, uh, they're making decisions without the regard to uh, what's going to happen to them personally. Unfortunately, um, that's not always the case. Uh, and, and we all know of examples where on a, uh, on a political campaign, many promises are made, many uh, uh, things are said in terms of this is what an individual is going to do, this is what they're going to do for the people. Um, and then when it comes time to actually make decisions, there's always a, uh, a reference to what's that going to do in terms of their ability to get reelected? What's that going to do in terms of the, uh, the, their political base, the feelings that people have towards them? So the influences and the personal consequences, I think, weigh very heavily uh, in terms of the decisions that the uh, in, uh, leaders make in, t in times of crisis. And to understand exactly um, how that all is put together, quantified, measured, and what it looks like, there's been a, a model that's been developed that I actually used in, in my research that enables uh, researchers to use surveys, questionnaires, and based on the answers provided from uh, the samples that are being surveyed, those questions are able to be quantified and um, 
put into categories that allows for uh, the scoring and application and identification of a level of moral development. And it's important to understand that what someone says on a, on a test or in a campaign or in a survey um, is uh, very likely to be different than what they would actually do when faced with an issue. So promises made uh, during a campaign may not actually come to fruition uh, during the time of, of a crisis. So <clears throat> what can we take away from that and what can, how can we align that quick understanding of, of theory and the decision-making process itself? How can that be applied to what we're talking about this morning in terms of the uh, decisions that are made in, uh, in times of crisis? And it all has to do with uh, an individual's rights civil liberties. It has to do with the ability that we have as, as a nation of individuals who are free, uh, who have uh, been afforded uh, rights, uh, a constitution that permits personal freedoms, and, those per and it also permits that those freedoms cannot be taken away or diminished. Uh, by a decision without uh, due process. That's all inherent. Those are basic tenets uh, of the Constitution. And those civil liberties, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to practice religion, and most importantly, the freedom to, to be free and to earn a living without interference uh, from internal or outside influences and most importantly, without interference from the government. So that's the way that as citizens of this country, we're able to support ourselves and support our families. So let's just quickly recap here. So with those civil, civil liberties that we now know um, cannot be taken away, uh, they are not to be infringed on, regardless if there's times of crisis or, or not, uh, those are our basic fundamental rights and freedoms as, as uh, citizens of this country. So the ethical theory, the decision-making process are all uh, used to, to do what? To ensure that as Americans, our civil liberties uh, stay intact and that the decisions that are made by our leaders are focused on uh, not diminishing those civil liberties that we have, okay? So with that set up, let's, um, let's start to take a look at some of these events that, uh, that I wanted to share with you this morning. Not only the events themselves, but also decisions, some decisions that were made during uh, those times of crisis. And let's start with uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, Pearl Harbor, um, as we all know, December 7th, 1941, uh, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt quoted, a uh, day that'll live in infamy. Uh, he proclaimed that as he told the American citizens that uh, the U.S. was declaring war on Japan for their attack on the naval station based in uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So Pearl Harbor, um, a, uh, a catastrophic event that actually uh, was an event that uh, many people had predicted uh, would happen, not necessarily in, in Pearl Harbor, but it's safe to say that it was not uh, an event that was um, that came out of the blue. There was a lot of um, smaller events that led up to that. <clears throat> First and foremost, I think an understanding of the fact that in 1941, uh, which is something that I didn't know, 
the U.S. was the largest supplier of oil uh, to uh, the country of Japan. 80%, as a matter of fact, uh, of oil exports, uh, the U.S. had oil exports to Japan. Um, <clears throat> at that time, there was a lot of um, uh, skirmishes uh, between Japan uh, and Singapore, uh, Hong Kong at the time, which both were held under uh, British rule. Uh, Japan was also antagonizing and attacking China at that time in 1941, and had also made um, uh, threats towards some of the uh, uh, U.S. territories in uh, Guam and, and in the area uh, closer to Japan. So uh, it was very unlikely, or thought to be very unlikely, that 3,500 miles away, Pearl Harbor, was going to be the primary point of attack uh, by the Japanese um, at that time is in terms of retaliation for the embargo uh, that the U.S. had put on uh, its oil shipments to Japan. And the reason they did that is because of the things that I said before, because of the way Japan was acting and uh, things uh, were thought to be contained with these economic sanctions and embargoes on, on the oil that was being shipped there. So uh, much to the surprise of everyone on December the 7th, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, 420 Japanese aircraft um, struck Pearl Harbor. Uh, 2,400 Americans died in that attack. Uh, a number of Navy vessels, airplanes uh, were also destroyed, and it all happened very quickly. Again, it was 8 o'clock in the morning. So it was uh, near mid-afternoon on the east coast of, of the United States, uh, but uh, in Hawaii at that early morning on a Sunday uh, basically took everyone by surprise. Prior to that, it's also important to understand that uh, the U.S., uh, that Americans were not in favor of uh, World War II. Uh, they were not in favor of the U.S. entering World War II, but uh, after Pearl Harbor, that obviously changed everything. And the day after that, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, declared war on Japan, on Japan, and thus entered the United States into uh, into the midst of uh, World War II. So uh, those were the that was a a quick summary of the event itself. Uh, leading up to uh, the U.S. involvement in World War II and some of the immediate decisions that were made uh, was one also that I didn't know about in, until I started researching uh, this topic. Uh, there was an immediate curfew placed on the uh, three most western states, California, Oregon, and Washington, and there was a curfew uh, that was put in place and every light was ordered to be uh, turned out by 11 p.m. as part of not only the curfew, people couldn't go out of their houses after 6 p.m., but they also had to have all lights out uh, by 11 p.m. Uh, they were told that uh, they, they were to use heavy black paper to seal up the windows so that no light could escape. And this was all done to uh, because of the fear associated with continued attacks air raids um, that the Japanese would continue to do. Uh, they were uh, using, the government actually in those states uh, were using switches to ensure that the lights were turned off. They were um, using master switches just to darken the neighborhoods. And um, for the first time, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge also had all of its lights turned off um, at six o'clock. So the idea was to seal off in complete blackness the, uh, the with mandates of curfews and these uh, electrical outages uh, for fear of uh, continued attacks and air raids, and, and all in the name of the safety 
of, of the individual citizens on, on the West Coast. So, um, so that was one event. Uh, another one, more dramatic, more, more devastating, uh, more shocking, I think, uh, looking in retrospect, was an order that um, was uh, signed as an executive order by the president to immediately identify and round up Japanese citizens, Japanese uh, American citizens. <clears throat> 120,000 of them were identified, again, primarily in those uh, three Western states. Um, and, and they were taken from their homes and they were taken to detention centers. This is men, women, and children. These, these were entire families taken to uh, 10 detention centers in California, Arizona, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, and Arkansas. There was no appeal, no hearings, no due process. And the individuals, when they were taken, they had really no idea where they were going. This, uh, this was something obviously that caught these people by surprise. And it was also uh, a, a huge infringement on uh, the civil liberties of, of these individuals. Uh, the, there was a court case uh, filed by a Mr. Korematsu. It was taken all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, in 1942, the case was heard by the Supreme Court. And the, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the camps were uh, well within the rights of the U.S. government to uh, to maintain and uh, they ruled in favor of the government uh, and they said that it was uh, because of the threat of um, of terrorism and because of the threat that these individuals uh, could have posed uh, the camps were um, ruled to uh, to be constitutional and the uh, the court case was um, thrown out, well, not thrown out, it was ruled in favor of the government. However, in 1980, in retrospect, uh, Jimmy Carter, President Carter, uh, ordered a study of the effects of those relocation camps, and it was concluded that they uh, indeed were unjustified. Um, it was not an official Supreme Court ruling. This was just a study that was uh, sanctioned by the government at the time, and the survivors were um, were owed uh, uh, reparations of twenty thousand dollars apiece as as part of the compensation uh, for their suffering at, during that time. And as as you can see here, it was nearly forty years later, um, and that was for all of the living survivors at that time were issued the twenty thousand dollars. So. Um, then we come to um, probably the biggest decision, not only in terms of this particular crisis, uh, but in terms of uh, uh, the history of, uh, of mankind. And that was um, the, uh, the decision that President Truman at the time made to, uh, to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. And just a little bit of context and background, uh, the effects of World War II um, at the time, uh, three, four years into it, at that time, the U.S. troops uh, were getting weary. The United States had uh, done a number of things to, uh, to rally behind the troops in terms of manufacturing, in terms of war bonds and things like that. So it, it definitely was an effort that began with a lot of support from uh, the U.S. citizens, but three, four years into it, that support was starting to wane, starting to take a toll on the military. Uh, on the other side, the Japanese military uh, were two million strong in Japan guarding the mainland. Uh, there were numerous attempts to, uh, 
requested to Japan to surrender. Uh, those requests were denied. And <clears throat> the Allied forces even tried to, uh, to reason with Japan to get them to uh, uh, an unconditional or even a conditional surrender, uh, which uh, those requests were also um, refuted. So August 6, 1945, President Truman made, which he later said was the most difficult decision of his life, and he dropped a 9,000-pound uranium bomb on the city of Hiroshima. Hiroshima was a manufacturing city of about 350,000 people at the time, um, located about 500 miles from Tokyo. The, uh, at 8.15 a.m., the uh, B-29 bomber that had been uh, retrofitted uh, to house this 9,000-pound uranium bomb was dropped uh, and exploded 2,000 feet above Hiroshima. And the reason that it was detonated 2,000 feet instead of hitting the ground uh, was to heighten the impact and the overall effect of the bomb by having it <clears throat> explode 2,000 feet above the ground. It was the equivalent of about 15,000 tons of TNT, and that immediately wiped out an area of five square miles, instantly vaporizing 70,000 people. Uh, the uh, event, that event, um, failed to elicit an instantaneous surrender, immediate surrender by the Japanese. So three days later, a second bomb was uh, targeted over uh, Nagasaki, which uh, Nagasaki was not the initial target, um, but the primary target of that second bomb because of the weather uh, had to be shifted to uh, Nagasaki. And that was a another huge, huge bomb, a 10,000 pound plutonium bomb. Uh, that immediately then created a, an instantaneous surrender by the Japanese. And the reaction uh, was devastating, not only to uh, President Truman, but to, uh, to the United States in general. Um, and so the, what's, what's interesting is uh, the, up until this time, uh, no country had ever used a nuclear bomb. And to this date, today, no country has since then used a nuclear bomb against another country. So uh, a historic, unbelievable event that um, today is, is remembered um, very significantly. So um, with that now, the um, let's let's shift gears a little bit and talk about another crisis that um, a little bit uh, closer to what we would all uh, have memories of, and that's uh, the events of 9/11. And 9/11 uh, was the uh, deadliest attack on the U.S. soil since Pearl Harbor. Uh, the attack was uh, focused on the most prominent financial center in uh, in the United States and the world, and that was New York. And it was something that um, uh, America was not thought to be vulnerable to such an attack. But obviously there were weaknesses in the security processes, uh, 19 individuals in total boarded uh, four flights on that date, uh, September 11th, 2001, uh, from East Coast airports uh, headed towards uh, different locations. And as we all know, all four of those flights were, were, divert, were diverted. 3,000 people were killed, um, $125 billion of economic losses were incurred uh, four weeks, uh, up to four weeks following the bombing. And it took over 3 million man hours 
required to clean up two million tons of debris uh, at ground zero for a cost of almost a billion dollars. So the event, um, I think many of us uh, can not only remember the event, but can remember exactly where we were on that day. Um, it's still very vivid. And we're still living with many of the decisions uh, that were made on that day. Uh, here's, here's just a few examples. The U.S. Patriot Act uh, was uh, passed almost immediately, two months after the attacks. Um, immediately following the attacks, George Bush, President then, George W. Bush, declared war on the terrorists, um, and that immediately started what now has been a 20-year war on terrorism um, in Afghanistan and many other Middle Eastern countries, uh, all in the name of fighting uh, terrorism, uh, al-Qaeda, and individual terrorists. So the Patriot Act was passed, uh, which provided a couple of uh, primary things for the United States. One, uh, significantly expanded the surveillance capabilities, the ability that the U.S. government had for uh, monitoring um, communications within the United States uh, from U.S. citizens, um, and that uh, continued to expand uh, almost unchecked until um, Edward Snowden and his work uh, in the NSA uh, as a whistleblower um, came out and, and blew the whistle on, on the details of how prevalent the uh, surveillance was. Uh, what was supposed to be uh, to prevent terrorism actually took a, uh, a much wider scope and uh, that was that all came out of the Patriot Act, started with the Patriot Act. Also, something that we still are living with today is uh, the uh, creation of Homeland Security, PSA. Um, every time we get on a plane, um, the checks uh, that, uh, that we go through, the screening, um, the pictures that are taken of not only uh, the individuals, but also their belongings, none of that existed before uh, 2001, before uh, September 11th. <clears throat> the FBI, as a result of that, also was granted um, the permission to uh, execute and issue what's called uh, national security letters. And, and basically that gives free reign to the FBI. Those are still in existence today. Uh, that gives free reign to the FBI to obtain personal information without a judge's approval on an individual's uh, background, uh, banking records, credit history, computer records, cell phone information, text information, again, uh, ever-expanding um, authority to gather information as a result of these NSLs. The... Um, uh, federal law enforcement is able to enter and conduct searches of homes and offices uh, when uh, individuals are not present. Many times those are targeted and um, uh, take place uh, exactly when people are not around. Um, that's, that's all part of what came out of uh, the decisions made after 9-11. And just a more aggressive treatment in terms of immigration, uh, immigrants coming into this country. Uh, there's a philosophy of uh, people being guilty until proven innocent. And the ability to uh, detain, uh, send off, uh, and interrogate individuals all under this wide a wide definition of terrorism and terrorists. We all know about Guantanamo Bay um, and some of the techniques um, that uh, had been in place, uh, waterboard, waterboarding and enhanced interrogation, interrogation techniques all coming out of and as a result of the, um, uh, the decisions made after 9-11. So, 
two crises, uh, both Pearl Harbor and 9-11 decisions, uh, the um, impediment on the individual uh, rights, uh, more increasing with each crisis uh, that um, that we come across, all in the name of protecting individuals. But as you can see from some of those decisions that were made, they actually don't protect in as much as uh, perhaps um, go a long way in uh, taking away or diminishing some of the freedoms and some of the rights we had uh, for for the purposes of helping or keeping us safe. Last uh, crisis that I, I want to cover is uh, the one that we're currently living in now, and that's uh, the coronavirus. Um, the uh, the beginning of 2020, I think it's safe to say that uh, no one expected uh, what has taken place now over the last six to eight weeks, basically came out of the blue as individuals continue to to backtrack and and look at how it started and how it came about we're finding out more but i don't think any of that is is um truly documented now and and what we're living in now is uh in my opinion different than um what happened after pearl harbor and 9/11 because this uh this pandemic this crisis is really, I think, a, a perfect storm. And here's what I mean by that. It's obviously a health uh, health crisis um, for sure. It has also uh, created an economic crisis that um, when you take into consideration all of the other uh, events, crises that this country has gone through and add those all together, it doesn't even come close to the economic crisis and the economic bailouts uh, and and what is happening to the economy as a result of this. Um, the the idea uh, and so the third piece of that perfect storm is the political crisis that it's causing now as well. Um, all three of those, the enemy is is really unknown. Um, it's not like you can point to an individual or a country and say this is the enemy and and retaliate. Uh, this is this is something much different. And up to this point, uh, with the more than four million cases, uh, more than a million cases in the U.S. and the number of deaths worldwide and uh, the number of deaths in the United States specifically. It uh, it rivals the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic um, with the technology, the medical technology, and all of the assets that we have. Uh, we'd like to think that it uh, is going to be resolved in a better way um, than in 1918, but uh, we're still, I think, waiting for for that resolution. So what has happened, as we all know, countries have virtually shut down not just the United States, 188 countries in total have mandated quarantine, uh, shut down economy, shut down travel. Um, and it is truly a, a global impact. In the U.S., um, the federal and state governments are acting, um, trying to act in unison. Uh, but as we'll see, the state governments are, um, are taking on a, a life of their own which is uh, one component of this perfect storm that I'm talking about. So a couple of things as we look at the decisions that are being made, again, uh, as it relates to the health component of this crisis, we have all heard about the models. We've all heard about the uh, primary objective. First and foremost is to flatten the curve. And these are all uh, medical scientific models developed based on the data that has been obtained um, from around the world. And the idea is to uh, flatten the curve, to make it not as extensive, to make the impact not as harsh 
Um, there will still be casualties, but the uh, by flattening the curve with these measures, stay at home, quarantine, social distancing, uh, the idea is for our benefit to flatten the curve. Um, so as a result of doing that, uh, the objective, trying to flatten the curve, uh, international travel has, has been curtailed, um, almost non-existent now. I know in just in some of the companies, just to get authorization to travel um, within the U.S. Uh, requires a very high level of approval and virtually no international travel um, in large corporations is being uh, approved today. Um, Visitors are, are being required to self-quarantine when people go from New York to Florida. Um, and it has been determined that they're coming in from flights from New York. They are asked to self-quarantine. There's also been an interesting uh, uh, caveat that has designation that's been given to essential and non-essential workers. And there's a, uh, a distinction between those people who are essential and those people who are not essential. Many non-essential people find themselves today working from home um, because of the fact that they are classified as non-essential. Again, a, a moniker, a, uh, a title uh, that's, that's placed on individuals, um, like it or not. Uh, borders have been closed for non-essential travel, Canada and Mexico. Um, in the Michigan area, the, uh, the travel and goods that go between, um, the U.S. and Canada is, is significant. And a lot of those goods are still allowed to go, but the people who go back and forth for jobs, um, if those are non-essential jobs, then that travel has been curtailed as well. A task team was immediately established. The coronavirus task team headed up by the Vice President Pence. Uh, the national stockpile suddenly came um, under the um, microscope and we found out that uh, it was something that was put in place in 1999, uh, managed by the government. Um, but as we have found out, it has been mismanaged by the government uh, when supplies uh, were needed by the states. Uh, suddenly there were shortages identified in these uh, warehouses. So uh, a, uh, a quick call to try to stockpile, first of all, create and then stockpile that went out for masks and ventilators and things like that. Uh, this stockpile was put in place uh, for national emergencies, but primary reason was for the threat of biotechnology and bio wars. Uh, it's the state's responsibility. Um, state governors have the responsibility to impose restrictions uh, based on their specific state. In other words, uh, the president, President Trump, um, does not have the authority to mandate restrictions specific to Michigan or to Florida or to Nebraska. Uh, those are all um, mandated by the elected officials in those states, starting with the governor. Okay, so we talked about the, the decisions in terms of the health impact, um, the economic impact, is is significant and again much to my surprise uh putting this together i i quickly found out that um this 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 is really shocking the magnitude the dollars we hear about the trillions of dollars and we think well that's a relief package that's stimulus um it's to help the airlines it's protect small businesses no one's ever going to deny that no one's ever going to say those are bad things 2.4 trillion dollars in terms of the total, uh, with another three trillion three trillion dollar bill getting passed in the Congress last night, um, suddenly takes this into a level of uh, economic stimulus that has never ever 
uh, been seen in this country. And what it means in terms of the national debt is uh, we're faced with a national debt that uh, just has uh, pragmatic people shaking their head. Um, the, uh, the debt itself before the stimulus package was uh, a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars, just with the budget shortfall in 2020. Um, now with the coronavirus funding, it's nearly four trillion dollars in terms of a budget one year budget deficit. Why that's important is because now that that takes the current debt uh, to 25 trillion in total, not just the annual, the total debt. And for every man, woman, and child that's more than seventy-five thousand dollars, their portion of that national debt. It also increases the national debt to 133% of the gross domestic product, which means the debt is more than what is created on an annual basis in the United States. All right, so as we wind up here, the, the uh, impact of these decisions, uh, the third leg of this stool beyond the, uh, the health and uh, the economic is the political and the states are imposing uh, restrictions that are range from A to Z. And it's not a one size fits all. And there's uh, many indications that some of these decisions go beyond what's in the best interest of the people. Uh, for example, uh, when Boy Scouts are forbidden from placing flags on graves of the veterans in the national cemeteries, I think one has to step back and say, uh, how, how is that protecting the civil liberties of, of the citizens of the United States? Schools are closed, car washes are closed, churches are closed. One of the basic tenets was the freedom to practice your religion. Gyms and spas and barbershops and the famous barber in, in uh, Owasso, Michigan, and his defiance of, of these state orders. Numerous protests um, have occurred, and it's all pointing toward the idea that six to eight weeks into this now, people are are wondering um, how th how this is going to end uh, with a unemployment rate of more than 15 percent expected to go to more than 25 percent. 30 million claims for unemployment. Um, with the economic numbers that we saw, this is bottom line, absolutely not sustainable. Uh, more than 20 million people are unemployed, whereas in January there were 7 million excess jobs and a 4% unemployment rate in January. So let me quickly summarize here. Um, and the question I have is for all of you, where do we go from here? The decisions we now know uh, that are made uh, in the time of a crisis should respect the rule of law, maintain and preserve our civil liberties, should be within the framework of the Constitution. Um, using a crisis, though, to impose unrealistic executive orders, either at the federal or state level, we've seen examples of that. And uh, there's talk now of, as we do go forward, to continue to have stadiums where no spectators are viewing sports, to round up all the people that test positive in nursing homes and put them in regional hubs, whatever that means. The stay-at-home orders are now being uh, challenged in court. They're also being extended to unreasonable lengths in the state of California. Um, and in the state of uh, New Jersey, uh, where there's no time limit. Uh, in, in California, the stay at home could be in effect, according to the governor, until there's a cure found for the coronavirus. So let me leave you with the fact that we're going into a new normal. I hate that phrase, but we're going into a normal that's going to be different. We're going to be even more uh, restrained if we thought the the searching at airports was difficult. Uh, we need to get used to the fact that we're going to be tracked 
our temperatures are going to be tracked, um, and it's going to be a very different existence um, if we allow this to continue to go on. Uh, and I say that in, in a general theoretical sense, because at the end of the day, the decisions that we expect our leaders to make um, should protect life, liberty, and our individual pursuit of happiness. With that, I will pause, get a quick drink of water here. Um, and um, thank you for your attention for this. Uh, I'll uh, turn it back to, uh, to Dale to uh, see if there's any uh, questions or additional comments that anyone might have. And I would remind everybody uh, that we're using the Q&A icon. Uh, don't put your questions in the chat. Uh, put them in that Q&A uh, little icon you see there to the right of your screen or at the bottom of your screen. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier in your talk about uh, people make decisions based on personal consequences. So I assume that means politicians are making it on the basis of personal consequences. Uh, business people are making decisions on, on this basis as well. Um, I think that's human nature, isn't it? Uh, is there a different? Uh, how, how would you overcome that? Is that a bad thing? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a, an excellent question to start off with, Dale, because I also think it helps to um, solidify the foundation that I was talking about. And I think it's important to understand that, first of all, it's not a bad thing. Um, there is uh, there's no one judging whether your decision between right and wrong, which might be different than my decision between right and wrong, is any better or any worse. Uh, there are individual decisions that are made. Let me give you an example. Um, in probably the most life-changing decision that I had to make in my career, I, I knew the personal consequences that um, would be, um, uh, I would be faced with if I made the decision that I thought was the right decision. If I came forward and, and talked about the illegal, unethical, immoral activities that as part of my job responsibility, I was supposed to be identifying. Very, very easy to have as many of my predecessors before me did to have swept that under the rug and said, oh, wait a minute. I know I'm going to lose my job. I know the threats that have already been imposed upon me. I know the threats not only on me, but on my family um, that I would incur if I go forward and make the decision that I knew was the right thing to do. I went ahead and made that decision anyway. I knew the personal consequences and I said, I, I still need to make the only decision that I think is the right decision to make in order to live with myself. And so uh, many people, and I know of specific individuals that looked at that same situation and said, I, I would never have given up my job and the compensation and all the benefits and uh, with two daughters in college and a mortgage and, and all these things. So I, I don't blame those people. I mean, that's that's a decision that uh, that they would make. But it is different for for everyone. Okay, I'm going to go to the the questions now. Um, Logan asks, how can we ethically balance individual rights, continue our normal lives, with the fact that doing so may harm others by spreading the virus? How should we compare my right to conduct commerce, worship, and gather with family? against your right to health? Well, Logan, I think that's, um, that's an interesting question because I think we're starting to see many examples where individuals are starting to question this gray area between decisions that are being made for us, for our good, without regard to the individual impact that we all 
inherently have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <clears throat> uh, the the individual in Owasso, Michigan, the uh, the self-employed uh, barber who um, has taken every precaution necessary in terms of social distancing and following the CDC guidelines and uh, wearing masks, not allowing other individuals into his shop. Um, and still, the uh, state attorney general and the governor has said, we are not allowing barber shops in this case to, to be open. Um, at what point does an individual who needs to uh, feed his family, uh, does not have any ability to uh, take uh, federal unemployment, uh, does not have a pension, does not have anything except the livelihood associated with that small business, at what point does he have the right to say, this is what I'm going to do? Um, he's, he's now faced with the personal consequences that I just said that, that uh, to a different degree than I was, but he's faced with his own personal consequences that he could be facing facing fines, could be facing jail, and he's still making the decision to, to go ahead and do that. Not to put anyone else in jeopardy, not to do anything out of the ordinary, not to do anything that fall outside the guidelines that have been given, but to challenge the, the unilateral decision made by one individual viewing data, quote, science, and interpreting that to mean uh, that you cannot open your business because of my decision. I hope that makes sense. Now, in the example you chose there, we had somebody who was following the CDC guidelines, um, somebody who was being conscientious. But what about cases where, for example, somebody chooses not to wear a mask, they're interacting with members of the public. We know this disease is particularly uh, problematic because so many people carrying it are asymptomatic. Um, so, so how would you distinguish between the case of the Owasso Barber and other people's right to choose whether to comply or not comply with the experts? Sure, sure. Uh, look, look at uh, what happened in the Florida beaches um, initially, where uh, spring breakers were were still going and participating in spring break activities, um, as uh, restaurants and bars and and places around the country begin to open up. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, people are ignoring uh, those guidelines. Um, and again, as individuals, we have the right to uh, participate. We have the right to continue our what we view as our own um, um, way to stay safe, to keep our family safe. And uh, that's part of the political issues that I, I mentioned in terms of this three-legged stool related to this crisis, unlike 9-11, unlike Pearl Harbor. Um, this, this one is... Um, this one's different. This one is now choosing sides. This one is uh, defying government, defying science um, for selfish reasons, maybe, uh, for reasons just to be defiant. And it's um, taking on a whole life of its own in many ways is, is very unique and, and also very, very scary at the same time. We have a question from Parker who asks, what do you think will be the biggest ethical dilemma in healthcare as we continue to work through COVID? How will we keep high risk patients safe while reopening the economy? Um, healthcare, a great question, Parker. Uh, healthcare um, as, a, as a business advisor, consultant, uh, we've I've received many inquiries from um, healthcare organizations, from hospitals, uh, from organizations who never were faced with uh, an onslaught challenging their processes and, these, and their activities as they have been over the last number of months. 
uh, healthcare uh, providing, I think, is going to to be very different. The ethics associated with healthcare information. Um, think about that. Your temperature before going into a place of business, your temperature is going to be recorded. There's drones that exist right now in other countries that have the ability to, um, in in masses, detect red, yellow, green individuals' temperatures um, from a from a low altitude. There, there's a number of um, technologies that I think we're entering into this age uh, of uh, George Orwell, 1984, where it was just kind of sloughed off. Well, that'll never happen. I think we're actually at the doorstep of that happening, and it's under the umbrella of it's for the good of the people. It's for your safety. It's for your health. It's to keep you safe. It's to prevent you from this, 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 and this. Uh, as individuals, we're, we're going to have to make a choice. Um, if, if that's what we want to, to go forward, then, um, then that's what, uh, is going to be part of what they refer to as the new normal. Well, we're coming to the end of our presentation here today. Um, I want to thank you. It's a sobering message you brought to us today, but, um, Certainly, we are looking to our leaders uh, to serve the public interest, to balance these uh, rights that you mentioned. And uh, we have a role to play, too, don't we, as, as people to hold them accountable. And uh, I hope that we've learned a little bit of information today that will help help us to do that. And I thank you for uh, presenting this to us. Thank you, Dr. David Bezzetta. Well, thank you, Dale. Thank you for all of the uh, participants uh, this morning uh, on a on a Saturday morning. Uh, Dale, I think the uh, the event is a showcase of some of the things that not only I've talked about, but the other speakers have talked about, and that is the the civil liberties, the rights that we have as individuals. Northwood represents that better than any academic institution that I've come across in my travels and in, in my lectures and uh, for, to you and to the people that help you put this program together, congratulations. And it was my privilege and my honor to be part of it today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.